one of the big guys in politics in the US said once the dollar is our currency and your problem. So okay, <laughs> what does it mean exactly the dollar crashes? I mean, how would that play out? Yeah. How well, when the dollar crashes, Americans now can no longer import without exporting. And so we, we therefore we can't import all this stuff. And so now Americans have to do without all these goods and our standard of living goes down. So we benefit right now dramatically. We get this huge subsidy uh, based on our ability to print dollars and export them and run these huge uh, deficits. But it's a burden that the world collectively has to bear. And so when the world no longer has to support America, you know, now the burden is gone. And now those, the, the rest of the world can start consuming what they used to give to Americans. And so that's going to be a net positive. Could you walk us through, I mean, you described this uh, from the viewpoint of, of the U.S. Could you walk us through how that will play out, let's say, for people living in Switzerland, making their money in Swiss francs, well, given that we have the Swiss National Bank, what would happen if the dollar loses a lot of value uh, here? I mean, the Swiss franc would become stronger? Well, uh, it, it would now, certainly but, become stronger uh, versus the dollar, yeah. whether it would become stronger in absolute terms, you know, in terms of gold, you know, for example, I don't necessarily think so. I think that the price of gold in Swiss francs is going to rise. Um, but, you know, I think the, the, the main beneficiaries of the dollar's decline, I think will be more the emerging markets, because uh, that's where a lot of the stuff that we in America import has come from. You know, I mean, we have a trade deficit with Switzerland. I forget, you know, we have a trade deficit with, I think, Uh, with pretty much every country in the world. But I don't know that it's that large with, 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 with the Swiss, um, so much as it is with a lot of these Asian countries that are producing you know, these mass quantities of, uh, of goods that, that we consume. Uh, but I think a lot of those countries will see the, the biggest relative appreciation of their currencies and, and therefore the biggest you know, relative increase in their standards of living and then china would be yeah i think one economy yeah i mean i mean in, in in u.s dollar terms they then, then they would be yeah the number one economy yes i think that the chinese economy is going to be the largest in the world much sooner than people think because mm. a lot of that is going to be a function of the exchange rates mm. um and yeah if they you know right now you're looking at what is like six and a half you know our, you know uh, yuan of the dollar Well, let's say that goes to, you know, three to one. The yuan doubles in value. That alone would, would, would put China number one. Yeah. And, and, of course, that means that everybody's income in China doubles in dollar terms. Right now, their savings have doubled in dollar terms. So it's a much wealthier nation on a relative basis to the United States. But, of course, if the Chinese currency were to double in value, that would mean that the Chinese businesses they would no longer need to export as much stuff to America because their own citizens would have all this extra purchasing power. And so the Chinese would then be buying more of what they produce and Americans would be buying less. And so Americans would have to do without those things. Is it a little bit like the Romans back then, 2,000 years ago? So the Americans are like the Romans of today? So they well, have a, I mean... They have built up a huge imperial thanks to their weapon, the US dollar. <laughs> they can uh, live like kings and, and, oh. and princes and well, they are losing everything. I mean, America is like Rome in the sense that, you know, Rome was this huge world power and eventually it fell. And the same thing is happening to America. I mean, it's just in a condensed time frame. Rome was around for a thousand years. Uh, and, and America is not dominating the world for a thousand years. I mean, I think our, our peak period has already passed. Uh, but the dollar is still, you know, there and still. So we're, we're holding on to a lot of our power as long as the dollar doesn't crash. But I think that a dollar crash is not only inevitable, but, you know, nearing. And, and so that will bring the American era you know, to an end. Now, the question is, you know, can America come back? I mean, it's rare. I mean, China came back. I guess I think China dominated the world at one time. I forget when. It's been a while. And so now it took a long time to come back. But look, Britain is a shadow of what it once was. France, I mean, not never France. Spain is a shadow. It was once dominant. Portugal, the Dutch once dominated. I mean, so you have periods of time. The, the countries, you know, they've never come back to achieve 
that status. So could America at some distant point in the future be on top again? Yeah, it's, it's possible. Depends on the president. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Ooh, but it's, I think China is going to get such a big lead, it's going to be hard to, uh, to, to overtake them. Uh, and, and plus, I think once America falls, unfortunately, a lot of bad things are going to happen to make us poor. Because if you look at the political landscape in the United States right now, socialism, communism, you know, fascist ideas, they don't, you know, they won't acknowledge that as fascist. But this type of central government planning, big government, has never been more popular and more widely accepted, nor has capitalism or freedom ever been, you know, uh, you know, less popular. And, and so to the extent that we have this big collapse in the U.S., we have a currency crisis, we have a major economic collapse, the odds that we blame it on government and on central banking and that we emerge from that with, okay, we've had enough of this big government. What we need now is capitalism and freedom. And, you know, we're all going to be, you know, you know, like Ayn Rand, you know, we're going to go back to the founding fathers, you know, um, the odds of us going in that direction to me seem pretty slim. What seems more likely is that everything gets blamed on capitalism. This is what happens with too much greed and too much wealth and, and too much concentration of power. And so we need the government to nationalize all this stuff. We need the government to get take control of the means of production. Everybody, everybody needs to be equal. And so we're probably going to go through a long period of, of that. The Soviet Union. Yes, yes. Of yeah. The United States. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, see that. we're, you know, I don't know. I mean, we don't, you know, when I ran for Senate, I ran, you know, back in 2010. And, and Who wants to become a senator? Nah, I didn't really want to, but I ran. For which party you had? I was in the Republican Party. But, you know, one of the questions I would always get was, do you support building a wall, right, on, on the Mexican border? And the reason I always said no was because my fear was that one day the wall would be used to keep the Americans in, not the Mexicans out. You know, and so this could happen, you know, because if things get bad enough in America, people are gonna wanna leave. Well, we already know what, you know, what countries do when they impose socialism and then people try to leave, they stop them from leaving. If you leave the country, you still have to pay the taxes in the US. Right? Well, yeah, that's unfortunate, the American tax system it's uh, we tax you no matter where you live, so you actually have to renounce your citizenship. But there's a big tax to do that, that too. Easy? Or how much does that cost? Or well, it depends on how much wealth you have. Yeah. You know, it's a tax on the unrealized uh, appreciation of your assets. Um, but you know, I mean, I live in Puerto Rico right now, so that right now that's a viable solution for me. You don't pay taxes there, or how does? Well, I pay work? much lower taxes, just like a lot of people are living here in Switzerland. There's zero capital gains in Switzerland, but not for me. I mean, for I mean, for you guys, there's no capital gains. Or if a Canadian moves here and decides to live in Switzerland, they can have no capital gains. But as an American, if I decide to live in Switzerland, even though Switzerland isn't going to tax me with capital gains, the U.S. government is still going to tax me. But living in Puerto Rico is my only out. They say, okay, if you live in Puerto Rico, we're not going to tax you. 